Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us at the East West Center. We're absolutely delighted today to have uh, Mr. Scott Morris from the Center for Global Development. In the invitation, you have his uh, very uh, detailed background and expertise, and he's doing some terrific work that our colleague, uh, Dr. Ellen Frost, who's a senior advisor here, brought to our attention. and. It overlaps with some of the work the East-West Center is doing in the space of mainland Southeast Asia, infrastructure work, and uh, building some networks in the region. So we wanted, since he's just down the road, we thought we'd ask uh, Mr. Morris if he would be willing to spend about an hour and a half with us today and uh, give us the results of this study, which you may have seen and you can get online uh, from the center that looks at, uh, uh, takes the case study of this railway as part of this larger Pan-Asian railway and uh, some of the economic implications, procurement, social issues, labor issues. And so it's a great opportunity to hear from him. Uh, we have, you've seen the list of experts around the room. We, our seminars are run informally. We're gonna give Mr. Morris maybe about 50 minutes or so to go ahead and he has a PowerPoint, lay out the case and, and and his points, and then we'll have about a half an hour for discussion. Just ground rules so everyone understands this program, uh, he's agreed that it be on the record and it is being live streamed for people who couldn't be here in person. So it will be later posted to the website uh, for reference if you, if you want to follow up on any further details. But with that, let me again thank you, Scott, for agreeing to do this, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And then we'll go to Q and A, and you can hear who's around the table and then they ask a question or make a point. Okay, okay. Great. thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. and um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I assume I do need the mic, otherwise I could stand up. Uh, yeah, what do you think? Uh, I think they can probably Better hear if you. I stay on the mic. Better. That's if, fine. Yeah. If it's so, possible. So I'll, yeah. I'll stay seated here. Um, so um, yeah, appreciate the opportunity, and absolutely on the record, I you know I was uh, in this U.S. government for quite a number of years, and the rule was always off the record. Right. I'm at a think tank now; the rule is always on the record. Uh, so we you know we want to make sure our work um, has some visibility, and where there are audiences for it, we're happy to um, come talk about it. Uh, so thank you all for um, uh, showing up. Um, so I will. Um, uh, walk you through a series of slides that, that outline uh, what I tried to do with this particular case study. Um, I'll also use it um, to give you a broader context for our work at the Center for Global Development um, around the question of China's role in the world as a source of financing uh, for development, particularly in developing countries like Laos. Um, what are the issues that deserve attention there? Um, and specifically within that framing, uh, say in contrast to <coughs> the broader context of a lot of the particularly US-China discussions in Washington right now, which obviously are dominated mm. by the trade war, um, by various aspects of security concerns and issues, and sort of what you know, the more vague um, <coughs> framing of strategic interests. Um, and of course, the financing plays a a, a big role in that, but one of our key objectives at the center is to, to try to focus on uh, specifically from a development, you know, an economics-based development perspective, what are the issues that we see with uh, the approach that China takes in its financing activities uh, in developing countries. So this particular case study was uh, one take on that, uh, frankly, uh, a little bit of a departure for the work that that I have been doing, and again, I'll, I'll reference some of the uh, work that has been more foundational for us, um, particularly on the economics of, of Chinese financing uh, under the Belt Road Initiative in particular. Um, but I did, I decided um, I wanted to take a look uh, at a project. Um, again, not my typical approach, but frankly, it's, it is more of an approach that defines a lot of the research around China in the world, and that, uh, as, as I will discuss, is is to some degree a function of one of the problems of China's approach, which is the lack of transparency. And it tends to drive a research agenda that, that is not able to rely as much on the typical kind of databases that are um, fed by official reporting and statistics 
and is more driven by almost more of a journalistic approach, uh, showing up in country, looking at projects, doing interviews. Um, for better or worse, uh, our center is not so well equipped to go all in with that kind of thing. We don't have big field staff. We don't have country offices. So um, I decided to take a stab at doing a, a case study that it was a desk-based case study, uh, trying to generate as much information as I could from public sources, media sources, and uh, to some degree interviews. Um, and perhaps more importantly, to try to draw out uh, a broader thinking about policy and the policy framework that sort of reveals itself or doesn't when it comes to the, this particular project. So um, let me say, by the way, uh, I'm all for informal. We do a lot of these kinds of sessions at the center. You should feel free to speak up along the way if anything uh, isn't making sense to you or you want to uh, ask a question. I'm happy to pause and, and take questions. So um, why this project in particular? Well, um, I would describe this Laos Railway as as a core BRI investment, even uh, say an emblematic BRI investment. And I think that there are a number of dimensions to that. Um, it is particularly as the initiative itself has evolved in different ways that frankly make it harder to understand, perhaps not easier to understand. So it certainly uh, has become more expansive geographically from the earliest discussions. It is now invoked in places as far afield as Latin America. Um, it has various dimensions to it that are far afield from economics and financing. Uh, there are car cultural aspects. A lot of that that you know I certainly am not equipped uh, to grapple with um, in, in thinking about uh, you know, case studies. Uh, this is a railway. It is um, physical infrastructure in the most physical sense. Um, it is a big project in financing terms. Um, it is fundamentally about trade linkages, transport linkages to support trade, um, and it is directly in China's neighborhood. So all of these features, not to mention things like um, alignment of governments um, in terms of uh, uh, the type of governance that the, the countries have, um, it, it seems to me that if if we're going to understand um, where Belt and Road is going to, by its own terms, have some success or not, um, this was a pretty good project to look like, look, look at, because it, you know, by no means is it an outlier in thinking about what Belt and Road is supposed to be about, um, and uh, in terms of priorities for China, this set of project in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, defined in, on the right and looking at the rail linkages, the intended rail linkages, um, clearly uh, stand to gen generate a lot of economic benefit as a regional project. And we'll come to the question of whether that assertion also holds for Laos in particular and why there might be a, a divergence there. Um, so that's, that's basically the reason for doing this, this particular look at one piece of the rail linkage, which is obviously part of this broader framing of the initiative, which has grown broader still, even from something like this, this basic map. So what I've done um, and what I will do uh, is uh, lay out the basic elements of the financial transaction as best I understand it, uh, again, based on publicly reported information. And then I go in uh, to different dimensions of thinking about the project, starting with a discussion of the of the economics, um, and particularly within the economics, the debt risks associated with the project in relation to uh, whatever economic returns would be generated for the, for the country of Laos, the government itself, its citizens, um, and then focus on procurement policy and why that matters uh, for failure or success uh, risks uh, that again that Laos may be bearing. Um, I then go on to look at. Um, uh, labor uh, issues associated with the project. Then finally, uh, what in particularly in the multilateral settings in institutions like the World Bank, we call environmental and social safeguards, but basically the whole set of standards and, and policies around uh, assessment and treatment of environmental impact with particularly with physical infrastructure projects. And then uh, social safeguards, which are essentially 
how are you handling the needs and concerns of local communities that are impacted by the project? Uh, and in, in all of these areas, I, you know, I learned a lot, frankly, by looking closely at this one project in terms of where are the risks and, and, and potential areas of concern. So just very briefly, in, in characterizing the project itself, this is roughly a $6 billion infrastructure project. Um, it is structured as, as a joint venture with equity participation uh, from the Chinese government and, and the government of Laos. Um, that in itself is, a, is an interesting uh, approach to something like this when we consider, number one, that the, the Chinese uh, government has the majority stake, so it's 70-30. I think that's right. I haven't looked at this in a while. Um, and that to get, even to support that 30% equity <coughs> participation on the Laos side, the government of Laos has to do quite a lot of borrowing from the Chinese government to get there. Um, on top of that, there is still a gap in financing that I have not seen evidence yet of how they are filling that. There are additional commitments that the government of Laos have made on the cost of resettling local populations. Again, we'll come back to that. Um, that are considerable. Um, and again, all of these uh, imply uh, fiscal obligations on the part of the government, uh, both in the near term and then in the longer term when it comes to uh, paying back um, the initial loan, which is uh, a China XM Bank uh, loan uh, to the government. Now, um, let me stick with this to say, you know, again, it, it's a striking feature that this is structured um, as a joint venture with this equity participation, because frankly, um, and you'll hear me a number of times throughout this presentation talk about the World Bank, we could just as easily say the Asian Development Bank, or frankly, the AIB as a Chinese led institution. <coughs> as an important comparator. How would they do a project like this if they were to do it? Um, and the short answer is number one, they likely wouldn't do it uh, because the size of the project in, as a one-off uh, is well beyond anything that they would, they would believe is uh, within the capability of the government of Laos. That essentially, it doesn't make sense to pursue a $6 billion project uh, given the size of Laos's economy, the fiscal capacity of the government uh, in terms of where they are today. Now, to some degree, that informed the Chinese on this too. Um, they certainly did not attempt to lend $6 billion to the government of Laos so that Laos could proceed to build a project. Um, and I think that informs the basic uh, financing structure is that um, the only way to proceed was to treat this as a Chinese-owned project that happened to be located in another country um, with a minority participation from the government of that country. And as I said, even with that kind of structure, um, we'll come to next, still very clear uh, concerns arise around the debt sustainability of this um, in terms of uh, uh, what Laos has the ability um, to support. Um, <laughs> Now, um, so let's look more closely at this general question of debt risk. And um, this is where I, in terms of broader context for what we are doing at the Center for Global Development, our interest in China really um, was spurred around this basic question of, with all this Chinese financing in the developing world, particularly what is promised under Belt and Road, um, that's a lot of money on offer. Can these countries afford to borrow at these levels? So. We were, um, we were motivated to try to answer that question last year, and we did a study, very much a macro level study across countries, um, looking at uh, the debt risks these countries currently face, and then what happens when you add all of these Belt and Road projects uh, to their balance sheets. And what we concluded um, was what may look like a very messy chart. I apologize for that, but I'll spend a minute and walk you through. Uh, particularly where Laos fits into this. So what we concluded is that for a, a relatively small number of countries, but a significant number, in this case eight, that we viewed as really to be at the extreme in terms of the risk of debt distress as a result of this kind of borrowing from China under the Belt and Road Initiative. So what, what we're trying to capture in the picture here are, are two really important characteristics that, that we observed. One is, is the debt risk itself. So 
Uh, economists typically, when they're looking at um, whether a country can sustain its debt, the measure they want to use is the debt in relation to the overall size of the economy. There are other measures you can use, but that's a pretty good um, thumbnail approach. Um, and more or less, particularly for countries that are developing economies, um, if you're above this threshold of 60% of debt to GDP, I should say external debt, so debt owed to creditors outside of the country, which you have to repay not in your own currency, but in a so-called hard currency, typically US dollars. Um, once you're above that 60% threshold, it's starting to become uh, an area of concern um, in terms of your ability to sustain uh, that kind of debt. Um, so what we've done is show, we show initially where each country is on that scale, and then the arrow, that distance in the arrow is showing what happens when you add in these Belt and Road projects to so their debt levels. So first of all, you want to look how much are countries moving to the right. Um, that's their overall debt is growing. But then the other dimension of this that is important, certainly very important for, for Laos among all these countries, um, is how much of that debt is owed to China in particular. And that's what we're looking at when we look how much things move upward. So that's China as a total share on the vertical axis. So you have, I've circled Laos here. What is striking um, is that not necessarily a lot of movement on their overall debt burden, although as we'll see in a few more slides, it's still a major concern, but certainly a lot of concentration with China as, as the creditor to Laos that has been growing to a degree that um, uh, almost to the degree of a country like Djibouti, where for all effective purposes, China is the only external creditor to Djibouti. That has a lot of implications, not strictly economic ones. It certainly um, implies a lot about the basic relationship between the two governments and the degree to which um, the Chinese has leverage over, over the um, borrowing country. Frankly, in some instances, the degree to which the borrowing country may have some leverage over China when they have that amount of exposure. Uh, and it really, it's hard to find much precedent for that kind of behavior for a creditor country to be that heavily concentrated in another country. I think certainly in the West, there are cases of client countries where when you look at the financing relationship, um, we may see something akin to this, but frankly, historically, um, the relationships were defined more by a lot of free money basically the U.S. government giving a lot of grants uh, to countries for reasons that might be driven by foreign policy. What defines China uniquely is um, the amount of lending. Um, this is money that has to be paid back fundamentally, and that creates a set of risks for the borrowing countries. So let's look a little more closely at, at Laos' debt situation. So what we see here um, is the amount of growth in uh, of uh, Laos's debt overall. Um, they have been on a borrowing spree, um, say, in the last decade. Um, it is important to, as much as that is a uh, risk factor as we look forward um, in terms of their capacity to continue to borrow, we should also recognize um, its economic effects um, to date, which um, to some degree have largely been positive. Uh, the, the economy of Laos has grown a lot. Um, poverty has been reduced a lot. Um, so they, you know, they clearly have had success with um, a, a large degree of borrowing to support infrastructure investment over the last decade in particular. And we, so while this is pointing to a potential concern, it is also a reflection of, I think, what we have to acknowledge is some positive economic outcomes. Uh, we also see, and I, I review this in the paper, the degree to which um, you know, there is evidence of new infrastructure. Uh, um, and by measures across countries of the quality of in, and coverage of infrastructure, Laos actually is rated very highly these days among developing countries in its, in its cohort. Um, that is a result of this kind of investment spree. Um, what we see in terms of um, uh, borrowing from whom, uh, hidden in here is China's role. So if we're looking at these different categories, multilateral essentially being the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, um, 
Private creditors historically have been essentially absent uh, because this is a low income, not credit worthy country. But as it's as the economic picture has improved, it has had some access to private sources of credit. But fundamentally, this is a story about the so-called bilateral creditors. And within that, we can infer that we're mostly talking about China, um, not exclusively. And you know, I, I think um, this this is one of the challenges of a lack of official transparency on the part of China as a creditor in the world, but also in countries like Laos that aren't doing a particularly good job of reporting data on uh, who they're getting the money from, on what terms, et cetera. Um, but um, relying on official sources like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, we can have a pretty educated guess that this pretty dramatic upward trend in the debt stock coming from bilateral sources is essentially coming from China. There's another feature of that, though, uh, that, it, that, that makes the rise actually disproportionate, and that is on the debt service. The, it's not just that Laos has been borrowing a lot, but the source, the, the creditors they're borrowing from do not offer as favorable terms as traditional creditors like the World Bank. So in, in our terminology, that we call that concessionality. If you are a relatively poor economy like Laos and you're borrowing from the World Bank, uh, you receive so-called concessional terms. That's usually defined as things like a 0% interest rate. That would be a nice thing uh, to get on, on your mortgage. Oh, good mortgage. I really appreciate that. Um, but it also uh, has features around the maturity of the loan. So typically for the World Bank, it's a 0% interest rate, 35 to 40 year maturity, and then often a grace period of even five up to 10 years, although that it's become less so in recent years. And what we see um, for Laos is a trend away from those kinds of terms and it's borrowing toward um, what we call harder terms, more market-based terms uh, for the borrowing. And as a result, you see the effect of that in this, on this side is there again, that bilateral, very steep uh, upward trend is that the debt service costs, the payments they're having to make on their debt have grown quite a lot, which comes back to pointing to the very, um, the very clear debt risk that the government is facing and its ability, uh, its fiscal ability to cover its debt. And we see the trend in the table that's explaining that by every measure, interest rates are higher, uh, maturities are shorter, so the payments are going to be bigger, um, and the grace periods. The grace period is the outlier. In this, for whatever reason, we, we see on average slightly longer grace periods in, in Laos's borrowing overall. Um, but what we capture, what we call as a grand element is sort of a summary measure of how concessional is this is the lending program. It's become, by going from 56% down to 46, it's become less concessional. So that's that's a basic overview of, of Laos's debt profile and the risks it faces. Um, I should say one word, um, and I do characterize this in the case study, is, um, again, the question of economic benefit. Because, of course, um, if you are lending to invest, investments have returns, and those returns, um, the degree to which you have the returns fundamentally affects the question of, is this sustainable debt, essentially is it good debt, debt or bad debt, or are you at a point where even with a sound investment project, you don't have the ability to service your overall debt load. And here I would say um, it is important to try to understand the basic economics of this railway project. As I, as I alluded to earlier, it does appear from the broader evidence base that the regional rail network, the, the six countries that, that will um, be integrated into a rail network that is linking sort of uh, inland uh, major local and regional economies to ports um, tends to make a lot of sense. And again, if you look at the kind of analysis that comes out of institutions like the World Bank, uh, you see a lot of support for trying to pursue these kinds of uh, projects. Uh, at the same time, a lot of concern about the risk of trying to pursue them when they include poor economies like Laos. Um, and 
you know, if we are, as I did with this case study, if we are looking at this from the perspective of Laos alone, not the region as a whole, um, then the picture actually becomes a lot more concerning because it is very hard in the absence of um, any kind of ex ante analysis of, okay, what are the economic returns of this project for us as the, the government of Laos? We don't see that. There's been, if that analysis was done, there's been no public reporting of it. Um, what we can infer from uh, prior such analysis and similar economies is that uh, it is highly likely that the economic returns for Laos alone will not justify the level of borrowing that they do for this project. Um, that has a lot to do with the fact that Laos is a small economy, so it is not linking a big market within Laos to other markets. Um, the railway itself is essentially a pass-through uh, for the country. It, you know, this is not really serving a domestic economy primarily, and it's not evident at all um, exactly how Laos is trying to capture economic benefits um, uh, you know, through uh, taxes and revenues, say, related to the railway. In fact, the only reporting we see around these questions are concessions, tax concessions, uh, which tend to undermine, frankly, the ability to capture uh, positive revenues. So just to wrap up, um, I'll skip this slide. Uh, this is a general, this is new research we're doing that shows a general picture across the world where China clearly is lending on less concessional terms than the World Bank. This doesn't surprise any of us who work in this area, but this is a, we, we found a way to look at across a wide data set to confirm that, and there's some evidence presented here. But just to wrap up on the policy dimensions of this debt picture and the broader economic case for this project is that, you know, I said at the time of, um, uh, of, uh, of this case study that essentially um, the task for China and Laos uh, is to be working more closely with the multilateral institutions on questions of debt sustainability. Um, in proceeding with a project like this to begin with, but then how to manage the debt risks over time. Um, what, um, it, you know, to some degree, this is an area where, um, you know, the horse is out of the barn. Um, you know, the decision was made, obviously the financing is proceeding, the, the, the railway is well along and moving toward completion. It is now a question of how does, how does Laos manage the debt risk it has already taken on. There again, I think um, coordination with the multilateral lenders who play a central organizing role when countries get into debt problems uh, and outright debt crises and say default. Um, I won't spend as much time as I could in this area, but there really is a critical um, role going forward um, and a critical set of decisions for the Chinese as to whether they want to continue a practice of unilaterally responding to these situations or to bring themselves into a broader system of coordination in which the IMF and the World Bank um, play an organizing role. Um, uh, relatively obscure institutions like the Paris Club of Creditors play a critical role. China to date has operated essentially outside of those existing systems. and. Uh, it is not to say that China doesn't forgive or restructure debt. In fact, it does so at a much um, more frequent rate than any other creditor. Um, uh, the Chinese may wish to point to that as a sign of their um, uh, constructive approach. I tend to see it as much as a sign of dysfunction in the basic lending decisions. Um, but the fact that it's not coordinated, it doesn't occur in the context of, say, an IMF program. Typically, um, it is often seems to be aligned more with uh, foreign policy outcomes, say, the visit of a head of state to Beijing or Beijing to the country. You see the announcement of, of some debt relief measure. Um, all of this is very uh, murky and hard to understand from an economics perspective. Um, but certainly the path forward, if we want to see a more sustainable approach for borrowing countries, is that there needs to be greater coordination, uh, particularly in terms of China's role um, in trying to do debt workouts. Can I just pause you here for a moment? I, I, if I, I don't know this area, so forgive me if this question doesn't make sense, but 
you started out by saying that this project, this railway project running from Kunming to Vientiane, would not really be an ADB World Bank project because the concerns would be about desirability and feasibility given Laos's economy, mm -hmm. de observability. Type. So in a way, can you ever get to the first order issue of, this is derivative of the problem because there's no other option. Could the World Bank and ADB have come in and said, you know, this doesn't make any sense given the cost and scale, but here's an alternative development thing that is financeable, yep. is desirable, is, would work for Laos's development. Yeah, and how do you is, square that? No, the first a, first it's principle. It's issue. a critical question, and it's not it's not an obvious answer. That's part of the challenge of where we are today, um, globally on this set of issues. Is that these institutions? In fact, I mean, it's not documented, but these institutions did take a pass on some version of, of developing this rail network. Uh, they concluded that it just wasn't feasible. Wasn't feasible. Um, and in terms of offering alternatives, well, essentially, no. I mean, they, they were not able to do that. Now, that, you know, and we should be clear, that is a, f a function of a couple of different dimensions, some of which amount to them looking out for Laos's best interests. Others have nothing to do with Laos. Namely, they themselves are capital constrained. They can only lend so much overall. Um, and, you know, the idea of a $6 billion one-off project, they, they just... They tend not to do that, and they have and they have capital stakeholders, so they, yeah. they need approval from their capital stakeholders. Yeah, sure. and there, and then there it does come back to risk issues and how they're allocating their capital. Um, you know, and it is, and it, you know, I tried to think through this myself. Well, what would be an alternative? And in a sense, I come back to the the structure of this deal um, as a joint venture. Um, you know, one could imagine, in principle, uh, a wholly owned. Uh, Chinese railway within mm -hmm. Laos, where the financing implications for the arm of Laos are essentially zero. Mm -hmm. That probably raises its own set of issues about the sovereignty of the country and to have this major, what would normally be a public asset owned by another government. Um, one can imagine that that would create its own set of problems. But from a strictly finance and economics perspective, you know, it's conceivable that you could have an approach, a China-led approach that says, you know, essentially, we are not expecting Laos to do any borrowing. Um, you know, you could even allocate equity shares in a way that are manageable uh, to Laos. Um, we don't have that. Uh, so, okay. Um, just very briefly to wrap up, then um, I won't dwell on this, but I will say, since I, you know, I'm criticizing China a lot on these debt questions. Um, just with the last Belt and Road Forum that happened um, in May, I believe that was May, right? Um, April. Um, they announced uh, we now have a debt sustainability framework that, that should help all the countries who participate in Belt and Road on the basic questions of is the debt sustainable? Does this project make sense given the debt profile of the countries? Um, it's a very interesting exercise. This framework uh, is virtually identical to what the World Bank and the IMF themselves use to answer the same set of questions. Um, that in itself raises a lot of questions. Well, if it's identical, why create a new one at all? Why not just tie your decision making to the IMF and the World Bank? Um, that wasn't going to happen. Um, to In large part, that doesn't happen on the part of other creditors either. Um, the framework that exists at the World Bank and the IMF most clearly governs the lending decisions of the World Bank and the IMF. Beyond that, um, it sort of plays a norms role. Um, it more or less governs the system, but not in any way that is strictly binding. So it would have been surprising to say the least if the Chinese overnight said, we are now going to, we at China Development Bank and China Exim will not lend to a country if the World Bank tells us they are at high risk of debt distress. What they did in the alternative said, well, we've created our own framework. The problem with it, um, both in official statements and what I've heard privately from Chinese officials, is um, they lean a lot on the word voluntary. Uh, what they're saying very clearly is that they don't intend to this to be binding on their own lenders. Um, 
So it's I, I come away quite skeptical that as much as the rhetoric in China has shifted around debt concerns in these countries, um, I, I don't believe that um, they're yet serious about moving forward in a way that, that puts sustainability at the forefront of their funding decisions. Okay, um, I'll move on and I'm going to try to go more quickly through these other elements. Um, uh, the question of procurement. Um, I will tell you from my longer history in government, it was the least glamorous issue that I ever <laughs> had to confront. And, you know, my eyes and those of others in the room would often glaze over and questions of procurement policy. And, and yet, um, it is absolutely fundamental, I would say, to uh, the characteristics of large infrastructure projects, how you go about procurement. Um, just to say, um, yeah. so to try to briefly characterize how we would look at the procurement, basically, who is able to bid to do the work of building this railway, to put it in very simple terms, um, and who gets, who gets the contract. Um, I increasingly believe that this is both a fundamental, you know, the way China does it is a fundamental characteristic and the fundamental deficiency of China's overseas lending program is the fact that um, if we look at the way the World Bank does procurement, which we they characterize as international competitive bidding, meaning when the, if the World Bank is to lend to Laos to build, say, a mini railway, maybe a $500 million railway, um, one of the requirements of that loan is that uh, Laos commits to a very rigorous process where it announces the project, um, and there are a lot of details exactly on how they go about this to ensure that any firm internationally has the ability to bid on that contract. Um, the underlying principles are informed by transparency um, and an effort to get the least cost bid, basically to minimize the cost of the project, and then on the transparency side to guard against corruption, kickbacks, bribes, et cetera. The Chinese approach, um, in contrast, is what we can call tied financing, that essentially the Chinese lender um, in lending, in this case, China in lending to Laos, um, is not saying, now we expect you to go bid this competitively to all international firms. They are saying, and here's the firm that's going to do the work for you. This is the Chinese firm. And in fact, it's even, you know, again, the equity structure of this, um, the majority ownership stake is the Chinese railway state-owned enterprise. Um, that defines the lending that these major lenders, uh, government lenders do in China. We should acknowledge, uh, I'm careful to acknowledge that while it stands in stark contrast with the World Bank, uh, Asian Development Bank does, the AIB, um, it is not at, at all out of line with what other export credit agencies do. What I described for China XM holds equally for US XM. It is uh, tied financing. Uh, when, when US XM finances uh, a deal, perhaps it is to support an infrastructure project, it is in support of a US firm. Um, what sets China apart, I would argue, is not necessarily the basic framework, it's the scale of their financing. Uh, China is operating through its export credit agency, but also the China Development Bank at a scale that has completely overwhelmed all other bilateral lenders. Um, in fact, if you add up all of the existing lending of this group I call the Paris Club, which is essentially the G7 countries plus some others, um, China is bigger than all of them combined. Um, and as I argue in this case study, um, at that scale of lending, uh, that creates special obligations on you as a lender that may look different from what other bilateral lenders are up to. Um, so again, what I, what I describe as the basic approach in this project is that uh, China is pursuing this as a public infrastructure project for itself that happens to be in another country. I think that's um, perhaps the best way to understand uh, what they're up to with this project. Um, and just to, um, uh, to go directly to the recommendations is, again, this, this notion of a special obligation that essentially, if China is going to lend at the scale of a multilateral development bank, then it should have the rules of a multilateral development bank. Um, 
Whether or not that's realistic, well, um, the rhetoric of the Belt and Road Initiative itself um, embraces multilateralism. We've heard that a lot in trying to characterize this initiative, that it is multilateral, it aims to be multilateral in nature. That comes with a lot of very specific obligations. Uh, if you were going to act like a multilateral institution, then your financing um, cannot be strictly tied to the, your domestic commercial interests. Uh, it has to have a broader framework that opens the process up to competitive bidding and the possibility that um, non-Chinese firms could actually get the, the project. Um, and then short of that, um, because frankly, I don't see that changing anytime soon, just some degree of greater transparency around these things. And again, it's very hard in this project to really understand uh, in any step-by-step -step way uh, the precise actors involved in, in coming together on this joint venture, the sequencing and discussions of the financing terms, the participation of the Chinese firms. Um, I will say there's a really good um, paper on the procurement policy of Belt and Road that came from the World Bank. And one of the things they note um, is in the absence of this full on international competitive bidding, at the very least, um, China should make more progress domestically to ensure competitive bidding among Chinese firms. And certainly in this case, we don't even see evidence of that. Uh, it was a single Chinese firm, um, not at all clear on the decision making um, that resulted in the outcome we have. Now on that procurement, if I could just ask you a question, if one accepts the standard narrative or con one of the conventional wisdoms on BRI that it's exporting excess capacity, mm -hmm. then this procurement model is not likely to change That's right. because the very essence of the driver requires the export of excess capacity. So there's no incentive to be competitive, even internally for political economy reasons, much less internationally. Yeah, no, that's, I, and I, I fully subscribe to that piece. Is that that, that, uh, that it's really, if you think about the domestic incentives, um, it's hard to imagine that this approach will go away anytime soon. Now, I will say, you know, something like this railway project might be in a different category than, say, you know, what we are observing with the relative decline of investment in coal projects within China, and then, um, as a direct result, a, a very significant rise in overseas coal investment. I think that very much looks like an excess capacity uh, dynamic. In this case, um, there's a very clear economic rationale for this regional rail project that has direct ties to Chinese domestic economic interests. Um, and I could at least convince myself, which is not the same as convincing Chinese policymakers, that uh, you know this is a case where what you really want long term is the existence of the railway. It's less important for you that you employ uh, this state-owned enterprise. So therefore, why not allow yourself to engage in the competitive bidding process? Not to mention that Chinese firms are actually quite competitive in these bidding processes. If you look at procurement at the World Bank, um, I'm not getting paid by the mentions of the World Bank. <laughs> uh, Chinese firms, um, obtain more of those contracts than any other country. Um, so, you know, in an environment where they're poor, and, you know, it's, it's conforms to one of the things we know that they they do tend to be low bidders when they're bidding. Um, we can trace that back to the overall structure of the economy, et cetera. But, yeah, so these are very difficult dynamics that inform the basic approach to procurement. Um, I don't see dramatic change anytime soon. Um, it is exactly the, it is why I see the need for focus from actors like the U.S. government, the multilateral institutions themselves, on this issue in particular, and and being very forceful critics of Chinese practice, um, because both I think it's going to be stubborn in terms of willingness to change, and is also very damaging in terms of the overall effects. Um, okay, very quickly, I'm gonna tackles the labor and then environmental and social together because they they fall into the same general category, uh, which is to say, um, in a straightforward way, we can understand China's approach to these issues by China's own statements, which is, uh, we, China, are South-South cooperators, that is the language they use in the development community, and one of the, uh, one of the primary principles of South-South cooperation is we will honor and respect 
the sovereignty and the rules of the country in which we are cooperating. What does that mean? Well, it means if we're going to build a railway in Laos, um, when it comes to environmental regulation, we're not going to tell them what to do. We're just going to use whatever rules they happen to have on the books. Uh, China has actually gotten a lot of mileage out of that kind of framing because it does speak to, frankly, the the zeitgeist of the development community. If you think um, these big initiatives in the UN, like the Sustainable Development Goals, um, even the behavior of the multilateral development banks, which tend to be harder nosed about a lot of these things, it has trended toward um, a, a principle that, well, we as external actors shouldn't impose rules and standards on these countries. We should respect their approaches. There may even be things to learn from in their approaches. Um, I acknowledge some validity to that. Cases like Laos, though, reveal the, the real limitations, which is particularly for low-income countries where government capacity can often be low. Um, the laws on the books themselves uh, can be um, unsatisfactory when it comes to the objectives we might have around treatment of labor, uh, environmental standards, social safeguards. Um, and it is sort of in recognition of that over many years that the multilateral institutions, but a lot of leading bilateral actors like the British, the French, um, tend to um, have a core set of standards that they say, if we, if we can't observe that you meet these standards in your national laws, then we're going to impose them for the purposes of this project because we have a threshold for what we find acceptable if we're going to finance a project. Um, that is very much not um, uh, the, the principle that informs the Chinese. Again, they, they stick uh, firmly to the notion that, you know, they will uphold the standards of their partner and, and work according to those standards. So it becomes important from that standpoint then to look at a labor issue and say, well, what do standards look like? Um, and this is a case where whether we want to consider labor standards from on, on the side of Laos or on the side of China, they ain't that great. Um, you know, and this is just one simple take comparing them to the ILO conventions, um, relatively low. I think for the purpose of the case study, you know, translating that into outcomes, you see a pretty rich uh, stream of media reporting that points to dissatisfaction in, in communities around labor issues. Um, use of local labor, uh, compensation issues. Um, it's not to say all of that um, is strictly a regulatory issue or a standards issue, but if you add that up across countries and a lot of the backlash, frankly, to the Belt and Road Initiative within developing countries is framed around these questions of labor. Um, are we getting a fair deal as local um, workers? Uh, are we able to participate in the project? And there again, um, you know, my framing of this also implies that ultimately, um, you know, the Chinese money is very tempting, but these countries are not without agency, particularly national governments. And when you think of the politics of, is of labor issues in particular, you would think that they would prioritize clearer and stronger commitments around local labor, labor standards, the use of, of local labor, um, and that's clearly an area they could do more on. Um, frankly, I mean, I think it is, again, with the backlash, China has tried to be more responsive. Um, this is an area they will selectively report data and you'll see some reporting on their use of local labor uh, to try to respond to that. Um, but um, it is, as with, uh, we'll go to the environmental and social next, um, it's an area that needs more attention in the overall framework of what we would call Belt and Road. Um, I think things like very clearly defining um, in terms of targets, use of local labor. Um, and then, you know, the second piece is a principle that holds across all of these standards issues is that given the scale of financing, again, with China being a special case in the world, it, it strikes me as incumbent on uh, Chinese policymakers to consider an approach that hews more toward what the multilateral institutions do, which is to say, we intend to respect local rules and standards and laws, but if we find them too weak, too low, uh, then we will impose a set of standards that brings them up for the purposes of our project. 
And I think increasingly China may be convinced even, uh, but will feel the need as a reputational issue um, to begin to go down this kind of road. So we see the same kind of thing when it comes to this set of activities we call environmental and social standards. So again, just very quickly, um, if I'm going to build, uh, if I'm going to build a railway, um, does it do damage to a local ecosystem? Uh, that's the environmental impact side. Does it displace a local community? Uh, that's the social impact side. And if we, I pulled together a matrix of what these standards look like for multilateral institutions and then leading bilateral actors. Because what you see with, whether it's JVIC or the French, um, they do actually tie their approach directly to the approach of the World Bank. Um, so you have this sort of network of behavior um, that is aimed at overall raising the overall level of standards in developing countries. And once again, if you look at China, Exim and China Development Bank, um, there is this deference to national law, and then in general, you don't see the kinds of mechanisms that exist for the other, the other lenders um, when it comes to this behavior. And, and we see the evidence of that in the outcomes. So again, with media reports where um, people were resettled, they had to move their houses, they were promised compensation, they haven't seen it, time is dragging on, it's not clear how they will be compensated. Maybe they were compensated, but it's at a much lower level than they understood it was going to be. Um, it's not to say in the history of World Bank projects, those kinds of incidents don't arise, but not to this degree. And it, 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 re, it reveals a lack of clearly articulated and binding approaches and standards on these questions. Um, that, and we certainly see it in this railway case. So just finally, on, in terms of recommendations in this area, um, I do think there is, again, a special obligation that China pursue a more um, consistent approach across countries that sets some kind of threshold for standards and approaches. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, these can be discrete elements, things like uh, a complaints mechanism that is independent from the project, so local community members have uh, a, a way to file a grievance. Um, there are, um, I would say, to think, you know, again, in terms of China's willingness to go down this road, it is worth noting that um, China to this day remains a significant borrower itself from these same multilateral institutions who impose all of these very standards uh, on their projects. So it is the case that there are any number of infrastructure projects within China financed by the ADB or the World Bank that have all of these features. Um, so uh, Chinese policymakers um, know about these kinds of standards. Not only that, but if you ask them, as I have, why, why are you borrowing from the World Bank, the ADB? You don't need the money. Um, and frankly, it's not much money in the scheme of things for you. It is these standards that they point to. They will say things like, well, as we pursue these projects in the Western provinces, um, we have a lot of concerns about the overall standards at the provincial level when it comes to governance, and we like the way the World Bank comes in and creates these mechanisms and sets clearly uh, defined standards. Um, so there is just a question of migration of practice from one context to another, and sort of the big question, as with things like debt sustainability, um, will these big policy lenders um, take on anything like that. Um, I think you know the short-term answer, and that is a conclusion, is um, probably not anytime soon, but certainly not without a concerted approach by the kinds of actors that are familiar to uh, this center. Um, you know, certainly the U.S. government, but also you know highly valued partners within uh, the region. Um, the G7 is a body, even working effectively within the G20 as a body to consistently um, raise these issues in a very specific way, not just, frankly, what I saw as the first two years of the Trump administration's approach, which is all of this Chinese activity is bad, um, you should stay away from it, full stop. That was the message to developing countries. I think that message is evolving. Um, it has to be much more grounded in exactly what 
uh, is deficient and what needs to be fixed. And I think that's really where the agenda is going forward. Well, that is absolutely terrific, uh, uh, Scott, if I may say, and uh, very, very interesting. We have a lot of folks around the table, I'm sure, who bring various ways of looking at this topic, so I'll just go around. For those who joined late, perhaps uh, just remember that we are on the record and live streaming. And maybe we could get the lights up in the back. Uh, there's someone on my team. Yeah, just behind you, ma'am. Thanks so much. I would just put the lights up the other way on the front. Whoop, that's okay. We'll try the other way. There we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. I saw Brian's hand first, and we'll move around the table. Just introduce yourself, please, and then we can go around. Yes. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Brian Eiler from the Stimson Center Southeast Asia Program. Uh, I mean, this is really informative work, and I had the privilege of reading an earlier version of your case study earlier in the year. Um, one of the, I first have a, have a slight criticism, and it's not necessarily a criticism of the report, um, um, but uh, I'll, I'll lay it out, and then the other is a question for you. Um, so I, I noticed that the, the report is kind of a use of the rail project itself to talk about Laos' broader picture of, of technology and um, becoming indebted to China as well as the Belt and Road. Um, so I think it would benefit from a deeper examination of the railway itself uh, and of, say, Laos' experience with managing rail, of which there is very little, right? Two kilometers going into Laos from Long Kai and then you know, rusted out rails at Sipandan in the south from the French experience. Um, but then also to, to, to let us know the number of people that have been resettled um, from the project, because uh, if we're talking about benefits, you know, what are, what are some of the costly impacts? Um, what are the environmental impacts? Uh, um, are there concerns about, say, unexploded ordnance um, within the country? And um, given that Laos you know, the, the most bombed country in the history of the world, um, and uh, uh, so these things, just to provide a little bit more context on the project itself. And I think that, that the issue is that it's reflective of no one knows. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know how many people have been resettled. We don't know where the resettlement communities are from the project. We don't know what the EIA is. I believe, I, I've not seen an EIA for the whole project or segments of the project. Um, so if anything, it reveals that more work needs to be done on, on developing a greater context around this, this project. Um, a question that I have is, uh, and I have several questions, but I'll just ask one, is in the broad picture of Lao, uh, the government of Lao repatriating this debt and paying it off, you know, what are some of the other constraints um, that are uh, kind of tamping down Lao's income position to be able to pay off the loans in the long term? Uh, we've been tracking, and my team does a lot of work on hydropower, um, breaches and EDL allow utilities uh, contracts with hydropower developers, be it Thai or China, um, on uh, not being able to purchase enough power. Um, so there's contract breaches there. When that happens, then there are fines and, and other issues. So this is um, beginning to create a draw down on, on Laos' ability to just service whatever debt it might have. Are there other broader picture kind of um, uh, constraints or, or events or, or trends that would prevent Lao from paying this debt. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you. That's and um, I very much take your comments. Even you know, I would respond on, um, you know, the things like the experience of, of dealing with really. I mean, there's a broader issue, and I do have a small element in the paper of um, the sustainability of infrastructure projects over time. Um, is it still going to function? Um, now, obviously, the Chinese have a direct interest in ensuring that. But on the other hand, you know, in a, as I pointed to the run-up in debt of the past decade and the you know, the infrastructure development that has accompanied that, um, it, it also I came away with a sense that we're probably at the peak of quality infrastructure in the country because what we also see is very little contingencies for maintenance of infrastructure and you will begin to see a deterioration, um, that in turn will affect um, the economy, um, which goes partly to your question. I do think, I mean, it's very much a macro answer, but um, you know, they are very vulnerable when you consider the need to maintain a high rate of growth overall in the economy. Uh, the debt risk itself is, you know, will factor 
critically into that. And you know, we we have a you know, there's a deep literature on the impact of debt crises themselves on the real economy. Um, so this you know they are in a very vulnerable position uh, right now. Um, you also alluded. To, I would say, you know, because I I can't see it. Um, what I come away with is a distinct impression that there are a lot of these kinds of, whether they call them contractual issues, but basically, you know, a set of agree agreements internationally that simply are not in the country's interest. And um, again, when you think about, you know, better approaches, it does, you know, requires a more assertive role on the part of partners that can play more of an honest broker role. That's what the MDBs purport to do. You know, how how can they better advise the government on um, energy sector issues, um, PPPs, all of these things that have, you know, they as much as they are espoused and held up even in, you know, like the G20, um, they don't have a terribly good history of particularly developing countries. And, you know, there's just, you know, what we call low capacity is, is leading to bad outcomes. Um, then, you know, on the resettlement, you know, one thing that struck me in digging in on this was even the, the price tag that they acknowledged when it came, you know, I think it was $400 million uh, allocated to resettlement. Um, it's not to say that money has flowed, but as a fiscal obligation, that's very significant um, and taken on exclusively um, on the Lao side. Um, so, yeah. And Lao, just to add a quick two finger, um, mm -hmm. it allows, Lao, it's, the government of Lao has a really dismal experience of pulling off successful resettlement. And when China's involved, it tends to even be worse. Mm -hmm. um, so, of all the development partners that um, have, or foreign investors that have foreign invested projects, Thailand, Korea, whatever, um, so from our observations, the Chinese projects are, are, are the worst mm -hmm. in terms of resettlement outcomes and the ability to reestablish livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And those are from uh, uh, Brian from Dan projects and Regards, other uh, and other infrastructure projects, mines, but, uh -huh. the railway. I see. Very interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm Bill Gore. I'm a journalist in Washington. My question is: so much going on now between the U.S. and China, and also in South China Sea. As far as this BRI project is concerned, uh, many countries, including Pakistan, is now in trouble because uh, China. Invest what they call investment, but uh, countries cannot pay. Like you said, Pakistan now is in trouble because China is uh, asking uh, back what they have invested almost 70 plus billion dollars. And now China is turning to US to help uh, economically and to their projects to China. So, what do you think? Is this is the uh, Chinese? Uh, that's what they are doing in different countries that they will invest now and then the countries will be like uh, slaves and they cannot pay back. So where India stands now in this BRI project, uh, rail project you concern? That's a little field from your study. But, uh, yeah, although I would say, you know, Pakistan is a, I would argue, is a leading case, um, whether we say a Belt and Road country or just, you know, in terms of its uh, economic relationship with China and China's lending behavior. And it also points to that um, it's one thing for Djibouti to be at high debt risk from a Chinese perspective. It's very different for Pakistan um, to be entering an IMF program uh, because of these problems. Um, and it, you know, in terms of China's behavior going forward, I can imagine that there will be more correction as a result of the Pakistan cases than the Djiboutis. There will always be um, you know, very clearly defined, you know, there's interest in port in Djibouti, it's a tiny economy, um, China can well afford to lose all the money that it lends to Djibouti, but I think these cases, these very high profile, larger economy cases like Pakistan, Venezuela, which is sort of pending, um, could drive more behavior because um, when we say debt sustainability, we typically are looking out for the interest of the borrowing country. But a lot of the agenda is actually driven by the creditors themselves who want to be repaid. Um, so I think um, it, it bears watching what happens, including things like IMF programs and you know, is China forced to take uh, a haircut on its loans? Um, 
how, how does that come about? What does it look like? Um, you know, are really uh, important questions that look different from from a case like Wales. And India, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Look, I'm, I confess I'm not a regional expert. Um, it is it is very interesting for me to watch how countries, India, I mean, Japan's a different case, but in, in a similar way, how are they navigating this? Mm -hmm. um, I think... Um, uh, India's vice chair of AIB, right? Yeah, so they came so, in, they yeah, came in very, it, It's a capital stakeholder. In they came in very early. Right. They have a project. I think there's, is it Mumbai uh, subway system? Yeah. In finance? Yeah, but, yeah, I don't know. So, um, and you know, the Japanese who aren't looking for the investment, uh, nonetheless, are looking for a, at least in the economic realm, are looking for a productive relationship. And um, as much as they will be valued, uh, partners and co-financing projects with U.S. entities, I think they will seek to do the same with Chinese entities. I think the Indians are, are in the same boat as much as they, they have their strategic issues um, on the economic side. Uh, they absolutely need a positive relationship with the Chinese. Thanks. Mark, who are next? Hi, I'm Mark. I'm a UC San Diego grad student and an intern here at East West Center. I was wondering if you could help me kind of understand better the the motivations China has to kind of do these projects. As you're saying, they don't make economic sense. There's a lot of risks entailed with them. Like Sadhu mentioned overcapacity maybe. You started to touch on some political economy issues. I was wondering if you could help me understand like why they take these like really risky projects. Well, um, not only am I not a regional expert, I'm not an expert on the Chinese economy, but I read a lot. Um, and it does strike me that uh, there is a different um, approach to risk. I mean, if we, if we keep this strictly in the economic realm, it doesn't seem so nonsensical to me what they're doing internationally when consider the management of the domestic economy where you have, um, you know, for years we've been looking at uh, over leverage and debt risks and um, the government is sort of consistently backstopped in a way that sort of, we might say, kick the can down the road, but how long are you going to keep saying that? I mean, is there going to be a crisis moment? I think there's just in a different, there's a different approach to basic macro management. And then, you know, at the micro level, um, you know, it's not that I conclude that this is all fun, this is all going to be fine for them, but, um, you know, the more pro-China, to put it that way, interpretation of this is, you know, you can have a, a risk attitude with a longer time horizon than we typically have through Western institutions. Um, and I'm mostly here talking actually about government behavior, not so much private, trying to compare them to private banks, publicly listed companies. I mean, if you think about the, the standards and pressures on say OPIC, US Exxon Bank, um, Millennium Challenge Corporation, you know, their risk tolerance, um, I would argue, is pretty low, actually. And it makes it very hard for them actually to engage in, in large infrastructure projects mm -hmm. in a way that is, I think, to our fault, us, the US. China probably represents the other extreme, that they, they have a degree of risk tolerance that has them pursuing projects. But, you know, I do think our, you know, the degree to which we would call these white elephants, I think, is an exaggeration, clearly. I mean, I think um, there are a lot of projects that are delivering really economic value. Um, but it's also the case that, you know, that depends on a longer time horizon. And that's just sort of a fundamental characteristic of, of a lot of large scale infrastructure. There's some new, I came across some new debt analysis on China that also took the opportunity to review the literature on so-called mega projects. So they define as any infrastructure project over a billion dollars. The looking at a 90 year history of these, only eight in a thousand are successful in the sense that they deliver on time the promised benefits. That's that's a remarkably abysmal record. On the other hand, um, uh, you know, if we look at the list of projects, you know, things like uh, the Panama Canal, Suez Canal, the Denver Airport, the big dig in Boston, um, 
they have real problems associated with them that lead to that kind of outcome. But if we look back 50 years from now on the more recent projects, I mean, are we declaring them a failure? You know, it's just, it's, yeah, it's hard to grapple with these questions. Um, so that's my unsatisfactory answer. <laughs> yes, please, at the end there. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Brown and the Friends of Chicago, and I'm in here at ADB. So I have a question. So if CDB raised up the, their procurement standards to the World Bank and ADB standards, so that will also increase their uh, cost of financing those projects. Now it's around $6 billion. So do you have an estimation if they are increase their procurement standards? And will that, so that will uh, anticipate to uh, increase their uh, uh, that's risk. That's risk. And mm -hmm. oh. yeah, I guess I'm not sure why you think it would increase. In fact, I would argue that it's going to lower the cost of the projects quite a lot because you know the very principle of competitive bidding is to, is to lower to drive the costs the, down. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, you know there is evidence that you know um, if we look at finance in terms of Chinese projects. Yes, they're less concessional than the World Bank, but to, to a surprising degree, they're actually still pretty low interest rates for some of these countries when you consider the actual risk of the countries. It, one of the explanations for that could be that the, the project costs are so inflated that that's actually where they're getting their money back from. Um, it's not so much the interest rate. So I would, you know, my instinct would be if they were to pursue more projects in a competitive model, the actual project cost would be significantly lower. So in that way, um, from a risk perspective, it's better for the lending institution. But weren't you also asking about uh, labor and environmental issues? And what that would increase the cost if they oppose those, how much yeah. increased cost would there be to the project? Not just I guess if you mean it like sort of administrative costs, well, in the procurement area, there clearly is, an, you know, it is actually from an administrative perspective pretty costly to run these kinds of processes. And then, yeah, if you're looking at what does that look like on environmental, there's both the administrative, like going out and commissioning an environmental impact assessment, um, and then also changing the actual delivery of the project to be more insensitive. That's where costs can, yes, actually rise quite significantly if you have to reroute it. Um, you know, different kinds of materials. Or, so yeah, that's fair enough, but I would, and who knows, I mean, nobody is gonna do a direct comparison of the cost savings from competitive bidding and then the additional cost of higher standards in other areas, I don't know. Did you have two finger on this? Yeah, please yeah, come uh, in. John, did you also? Oh, no, no, I'll say something. Let's oh, something separate, okay. And, and I've talked to Chinese contractors and construction companies about Belt and Road projects, and often they really loathe doing them. Um, I mean, it's good money, I guess, but um, they're, they feel that they're forced to take on these projects because the projects serve political needs, and um, which might drive up the cost. Because if you don't want to do something, you charge a higher price. <laughs> Did, did that answer this year, yeah. your question? By the way, on these loans, these are uh, Japanese, uh, Chinese yuan de denominated loans? No, no they're dollar um, loans. They're I was just almost curious. exclusively dollar denominated. They're dollar denominated. Yeah. So that creates a set of, of, yeah, that creates a set of risks that are even greater. Including on the Chinese, I mean, sort of the people, On the Chinese side, too. On the Chinese side, too, and sort of... As people project what is you know, what is the trajectory for Bell and Road, there is a macro element. To it. So yeah. To the degree that Chinese reserves are declining, right? You know, these policy lenders draw on those reserves. Sure. So that is a constraint. It's not clear to me exactly if the relative magnitude. Right. Is. And we'll never be able to get a precise. But, but if they're dollar-denominated loans in an environment in which. Chinese reserves are shrinking, and there's Chinese overhang debt, both at local and national level. Then China is carrying a lot of risk too. I mean, now with the, the very that the, in the very interesting chart you had here. I mean, I know there were select countries, mm -hmm. but that same arrow that shows the debt increasing for the individual collect countries, that has if if you if you add basically add them. That exposes Chinese risks to this, all this carrying this debt as well. 
which yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know where that fits in the overall debt ratio, but I mean, it, but it must be something. Yeah, well, I would say, I mean, if you go back to that original paper um, that the chart comes from, you know, we did conclude that um, for most Bell and Road countries, there are no debt risks because their debt profiles are perfectly reasonable. Uh -huh. um, so we are highlighting the subgroups, but it is, I mean, there's sort of a group of 24 or so where the risk is significant, and then there's that group of eight where it is a very high risk. Um, but you're right, even, you know, you add all that up, and it's it's not something the Chinese would be indifferent to. One thing I would say that's striking about the dollar denominated to me, it's, or I think it's, it's a puzzle in my mind, I've yet to hear a satisfactory answer, is coming back to this procurement issue, if you are a China, if you're a China development bank lending to Laos, um, and the delivery of the project is by a Chinese firm who is paying Chinese workers, why couldn't you do R and B? You know, it's such a closed system, yeah. and yet it, that's just not what that's they not how they do it. That's very interesting. It's still very much dollar denominated. I have Courtney next, then John Brandon, and then could we please, Courtney? Yeah, so Courtney Weatherby from the Stimson Center, and with Brian. Um, I was just going to raise one one note that I, I thought of earlier in your presentation where you were highlighting that infrastructure overall has supported the Lao economy, but obviously other customers. And I'm not sure if you saw the UN Special Rapporteur report on infrastructure induced poverty in Lao, but there was an interesting mm. trip earlier this year that essentially highlighted. And, and there's a lot more detail in the report, but highlighted that in many cases, because of the severe issues with compensation, with social environmental impact assessments and safeguards and the lack thereof, partly due to issue, bureaucratic issues, corruption issues inside Laos, many of these infrastructure projects are actually not a net benefit for the people of Laos, although they might be a net benefit for certain segments of Laos society. So I just sort of wanted mm -hmm. to, to flag that. I didn't know if you'd seen the reporter. No. For, this for is a report. UN special rapporteur. Yes. Um, so they, they, I don't remember the dates of the trip, Brian, I might remember. It's here. the special rapporteur on extreme poverty. Yeah. The one who, he did a, a study here in the U.S. as well mm -hmm. uh, on an invitation from the Lao government, and the Lao government has denounced the report. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, um, but it highlights sort of some of the issues in sort of the second part of the question. The issues with any of these projects is that often a lot of the, the risk and the cost associated with a project, particularly on the environmental social side, are not really accounted for because they're not the responsibility of the project finance or the responsibility of the government. I think your point about Lao taking on all of the costs of compensation for the, the railroad is a good example of this because we've seen similar issues with relocation compensation for a lot of the hydropower projects. So just sort of flagging that as a, as a question where from from for many cases there have been no truly successful projects in Laos in terms of relocation compensation ESAs that have been implemented well even um, the the sort of pilot projects for hydropower that the World Bank and others have supported um, have not ever gotten full great marks on these issues so it is a difficult situation for any investor but for China in particular, when there is this overcapacity issue for hydropower and other projects, and to the extent that it's relevant for the railway, sort of the issue of is it in their interests to change any of these, even on paper? So, more comment than a question. Yeah, no, thank you. But, That's helpful. I'll look at that. I think, um, I mean, I guess I, one reaction I have is, you know, it is a, the case that China, in pursuing its own path, you know, if we go back to the 80s, um, you know, the approach they're taking in other countries is the approach they took for themselves. So there, you know, a fair degree of indifference um, to various stakeholders. Um, so in a sense, it's even remarkable to consider that they are grappling with, um, as I said, I, you know, they clearly affirm the use of World Bank standards in select projects within China. So, but the, the, you know, now that they are grappling with the implications of that for their own behavior abroad, I mean that does mark quite a departure from their own experience. And I, you know, as I have the experience of talking to Chinese economists who are, you know, quite enthusiastic um, about their own development experience, and who's, you know, in many respects, who's to argue it's been it's been a miracle story in development. Um, you know, they are very dismissive of sort of 
individual rights issues, obviously, and, and all of these kinds of things. So it's it's a tall order um, to consider that they suddenly will um, have this different view in terms of behavior in other countries. John, I think we just have three or four minutes left. Yeah, John sure. Brandon, I'll okay. make sure you get in. Yeah, I'm John Brandon. I'm at the Asia Foundation. Um, I spent about five, six years ago, I spent about a total of um, four and a half months in Laos. And at the time, there was a concern um, about um, a significant uh, revenue shortfall in the national budget. Uh, while policymakers had um, grossly underestimated the revenue they were bringing in, about 50% of uh, budget is normally from the sale uh, of, of the national budget comes from the sale of uh, hydropower and also uh, mining. And they had uh, global markets had depressed prices, and as a consequence, they um, uh, they fell short by 23 hmm. percent. Uh, and so uh, they only got 77 um, percent of what they were um, expecting to get. That led to um, teachers not being paid for about six months. That led to veterans uh, not getting their pensions, amongst uh, some other uh, social services. I would imagine, you know, if something like that happens again in Laos, and now you have a, a railway project, uh, that, you know, who are you going to pay? Your veterans, your teachers, are you going to pay the Chinese? Um, it um, this uh, I think is going to the project is going to make Laos one of the most heavily indebted nations uh, in, uh, in in the world. And but I was also wondering in your research um, if. Um, one thing that is uh, there's a tension is uh, with labor that China brings into countries. Uh, you know, they could say they're creating jobs, but for the Laos, that those jobs are probably for security guards, janitors, things like that. Really, the, um, the white collar and the skilled labor engineers and things like that are not coming from Laos at all. They're coming they're coming from China. What kind of do you have you? Has your research revealed anything about that that's creating any kind yeah, of Yeah, but not with rigor. I mean, I'll say, you know, in this case study, what I read in reporting sort of confirms that general reputation. At the same time, like, I, you know, I'm in touch with enough of the scholarship now generally that I do believe people looking in the sub-Saharan African context would say this has been overstated, the degree to which all labor is imported. But I think you're right, you know, it just strikes me as not surprising that, um, given the, the basic model and the, the, the way the procurement is done, that um, you know, particularly the white collar jobs, of course they're going to come with. The, you know, it, it would be. It just doesn't seem at all efficient or sensible to me that you know somehow you're going to use entirely local labor. But it does. My instinct coming away from looking at this project is. In China's direct neighborhood, where geography is even more amenable, um, you're going to see a higher higher percentage of Chinese labor. And that's pure assertion on my part. It seemed evident in this case that there's a lot of Chinese labor and a lot of complaining in the local communities about jobs that, that weren't delivered um, or promised. Um, and then finally, one of you know just on your good comments on the the overall debt risk. You know, one other point to make as to why this should matter to, you know, whether it's as U.S. taxpayers and our you know, U.S. government as contributors to the multilateral institutions. In a sense, you know, this, even with China acting, acting on its own, it's still part of a connected system. So if Laos enters a high-risk debt rating, it automatically sees um, its financing relationship with the World Bank adjusts, and namely, um, it'll get more grants and fewer loans from the World Bank. That creates an additional burden for the World Bank. Um, if Laos is in a crisis, um, you know, a financial crisis, but then it leads to just other forms of stress, you know, even humanitarian crises, that implicates the U.S. government oftentimes. And There's ASEAN. Money. And ASEAN. So, um, there is a legitimate concern about free rider, free rider behavior. That basically, Chinese terms to the degree they are less concessional and are driving debt distress in selected cases. Um, there are a lot of other actors who are helping to bear the burden of that, and they 
it is entirely legitimate for them to be vocal about the concerns and try to drive better behavior. Ray and Eileen, you had one quick point. Very quick question. It only needs a one word answer. Here it comes. Uh -oh. From your assessment uh, you're being put on the of, spot, Scott. of the regional linkages of linking up with the regional rail network, we need to get a, a leg from Bangkok up to Vientiane to really make this work if it's going to do what it's supposed to do. So, from your assessment, what year do you think <laughs> Thailand will finish the link to Vientiane? Well, you're asking someone who's not an expert in Thailand. I think. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I think that's you know, that is the you know, He's. I, I actually I believe that the, the net benefits of a regional project like this are very large, but you have to have sort of a stochastic approach. You know, what are the probabilities to, <laughs> and and time horizon? So uh, again, it's pretty sobering if you look at the broader literature on the experience of these mega projects. It's they never are delivered on time. They are always over budget. Um, so. Well, uh, you could have asked Pavan yesterday on this question, Brian. In any case, I, I'm afraid we are at the end of our time. Um, but before we uh, thank uh, Scott Morris for what I thought was just a terrific presentation, a very interesting study that not only answers some questions about the specific project in Laos situation and the BRI, but also raises a whole bunch of issues about how this applies and how we think about this. Particularly, I found your comment about China welcoming some elements of World Bank standards in some projects, mm -hmm. but then not adapting some of those standards for its own. It's quite a telling about this whole question of how much reform can be in China as well on larger macroeconomic issues. In any case, uh, we, we will hope to have you another time for another one of your very uh, uh, compelling studies. But thank you for joining us. I just want to make it, usually I use this time at the end before we thank our speaker to announce the next program. But I'm not going to because we're going into this August recess. Uh, and since the government appears to be on the way of cutting a budget deal and et cetera, and everyone going out of town, the East West Center is going to take a little bit of a break on programming um, uh, for a few weeks, and then we'll return a full up in after Labor Day. Uh, but in the meantime, for some of you who have not attended our programs or may be new, please consider joining up uh, our, our uh, mailing list for publications, events, and fellowships, programs, and other uh, activities that you might be interested in. And uh, we welcome seeing you at another event. So thank you for taking the time. But please join me in thanking Scott Morris for his presentation. Thank you.